And we're now live. And hello, everyone who's joining us today. We're just going to wait a few more minutes while everyone gets in and gets settled on their technology. Uh, while you wait, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat menu uh, where you can offer uh, a sense of uh, what your position is, whether you're a student, an administrator, um, or even a dean or associate dean. And if you'd like, you can also offer a land acknowledgement from the territory that you're joining us from. And just a reminder to those who are just joining us, we're going to wait a few more minutes while people get in and get settled. Uh, while you wait, please feel free to introduce yourself and to offer a land acknowledgement if you wish. And one final reminder to those who are joining us, we're gonna get started in about one minute uh, and please feel free to introduce yourself and to offer a land acknowledgement in the chat if you wish. Yes, I do mention this uh, in my introduction, but there is a French transcription service available for today's session, and you can access that through the link provided in the chat. All right, folks, well, we'll get started uh, while people still continue to come in. Uh, welcome everyone to the second KEGS virtual symposia and to the final event of our week. My name is Ian Worley and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Association for Graduate Studies or L'Association Canadienne pour les Etudes Supérieures. Before I go any further, I would like to note that this session includes a simultaneous remote transcription service, which you can access through the link provided in the chat menu. A new window will open in your internet browser and translated text will begin in streaming automatically. On behalf of the CAGS Board of Directors, we are delighted that you have joined us here today. We hope that this week-long series of six webinars has and will continue to inform, connect, and inspire you during this unprecedented moment in the history of higher education. The events planned this week have sought to address a variety of challenges, opportunities, and inflection points in graduate studies, including student empowerment, the use of digital tools and technologies, strategies for collecting, preserving, and sharing data, equitable inclusion, and the struggle against anti-Black racism. The goal of this virtual event is to provide a forum for sharing information and experiences, posing questions, and building strategies for adapting to our new environment. Discussions on these topics have been led by a diverse group of presenters from across Canada, including deans of graduate studies, faculty members, administrators, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, early career, re career researchers, and even the president of SHRC. I will note that today's session is being led by a group of outstanding master students, and they should be very proud of themselves for being here today. Before we begin this session, I would like to make a few housekeeping announcements. I will remind everyone that there was a simultaneous transcription service available. If you have any questions or comments for the speakers, please feel free to use the Q&A tool. If you would like to pose a question verbally, let us know by clicking the raise your hand button and we can offer you the virtual mic. If you would like to converse with other attendees throughout the session, please feel free to use the chat menu at your leisure. Next, we highly recommend that you select speaker view on your Zoom screen by clicking on the top right hand side of the window. 
Finally, this web webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the CAG's YouTube channel in a few weeks. It is also essential that we recognize and acknowledge that this symposia is being hosted virtually from the city of Ottawa, which is built on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. CAGs and those gathered here today honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. I would now like to introduce our webinar for today. Innovation in Research Creation in Art and Design, a showcase of graduate students from Emily Carr University of Art and Design. This online event will feature six graduate student panelists from Emily Carr. Each panelist will be asked to present for eight minutes on their research process and creative practice in connection to innovation in research creation, defined as an approach to research that combines creative and academic research practices and supports the development of knowledge and innovation through artistic expression scholarly investigation and experimentation. Panelists will be students of the MDS and MFA programs at Emily Carr. The panel will be followed by a Q&A discussion with the attendees who will include graduate faculty, students, administrators, and staff from across Canada. This session will be moderated by Dr. Stephen Lamb, the educator, curator, and associate vice president of research and dean of the Jake Kerr Faculty of Graduate Studies at Emily Carr University of Art and Design in Vancouver, Canada. Initially trained as an artist, Stephen Lamb received his MFA from the University of California, Irvine, and was a Helena Rubinstein Fellow in Curatorial Studies at the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program. I now pass the virtual mic over to you, Dr. Lamb. Thanks, Ian. Hi, everyone. It's such a so lovely to, to see you all. This is, this is amazing. Um, before we begin, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional, ancestral, unceded, and current Tory current territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations, on which we're learning, working, and gathering today. So it's my sincere joy and pleasure to introduce today's conversation. I see today as a tribute, a tribute of sorts. We're not only here to showcase the work of our current and soon to be graduates of Emily Carr's MFA and Masters of Design program, but it's also a tribute to our teachers, our mentors, a tribute to how culture can compel us into action. Um, while this year has been filled with so much heartbreak and struggle, we've also seen on our streets, on our screens, mass movements of hope and defiance of how people are coming together to imagine exits and demanding justice, justice for the marginalized, justice for nature, justice for recovery. So while we're here to talk about perhaps the technical, ontological, academic questions of what is artistic and design research, what is cultural practice, what research creation can be, I want to ground this conversation to what matters. By paying tribute to how creative work fosters communi communities, how it enables new relationalities, how it relies on a complex understanding of identities and how it compels us to a place of recovery and collective care. So I wanna do a, a quote um, from Boaventura de Sousa Santos, who argues against the Cartesian understanding of the world and he's calling for a recentering of the senses. It's a lengthy quote, but I think it's a beautiful quote. Um, Knowledge is not possible without experience. And experience is inconceivable without the senses and the feelings they arouse in us. It is through experience that we open ourselves to the world. Without the senses, there are no sensations. Without sensations, there are no emotions. Without emotions, there are no perceptions. And without perceptions, there will be no world as it presents to us and as we present ourselves to it. Without the senses, it would be impossible to warm up reason which yields a form of feeling and thinking that renders possible the transformation of the world into a world conceived of as a personal responsibility." End quote. In short, artists and designers tinker with sense-making. You know, it's our job. It's perhaps our personal responsibility, our ability to respond through ethics, through aesthetics, to rearrange our senses and therefore articulate what may be sensible and what the world can be. So we need creative practices that are not solo practices. We need work that connects us to the world through experimentalism, play, deep intellection, 
one that is perhaps responsive to communion and also resistance. And as Rod Ferguson reminds us, progressive creativity is a multi-form social force. And we're not alone. And that's me, this is not Rod. <laughs> we're not alone. So let's make sure that work grounds us. So with that said, I'm so honored and pleased and proud to introduce our speakers. So the structure of our conversation is we're gonna have couplets, have dialogues. So we'll have two graduate students, one from both programs, the MFA and the Masters of Design. Uh, they will both speak about their work for eight minutes each, followed by a short, maybe one, two minute Q&A. And then we'll go to the next uh, duet. So while our speakers may all speak from a variety of perspectives, from different entry points, I think there's a common project that grad students in art and design articulate and make sensible. And perhaps it's a calling to respond to the ecological, environmental, social struggle. It's a calling for a broader understanding of cultural memory, of storytelling, of placemaking, right? Of embodied knowledge. So um, our speakers are, first up is Julie Van Ooyen, uh, who is a designer and researcher whose work involves embodied design uh, research, more than human interactions and public sector digital service design. Um, Julie, so modest, one thing she didn't put in, in the uh, uh, bio is she's a recipient of the 2019 Shirk Canada Graduate Scholarship. I promised you all that I would insert stuff in your bio. Um, and then Hamed Rastian is an artist researcher uh, whose current research involves creating a top topography of anti-colonial movements and forces with a focus on historical archives. He's held seven solo exhibitions in, our, in Iran, Switzerland, United Arab, em Arab Emirates, and has participated in more than 60 group exhibitions as well. Next couplet, next duo, uh, was Gemma Crow, who was an interdisciplinary artist focused on the mediated human image and community through embodiment and discursive practices. Crow is a trained dancer and filmmaker, currently exploring the illusory potential of spatial sound and vibration. And since this is a showcase of media work, I uh, just want to give a heads up to make sure that you all plug in your headphones so we're not just letting Zoom mediate the world. Boaventura de Sousa Santos would be very sad about that if we let Zoom uh, represents the world. <laughs> Following Gemma is uh, Shola Oluwa, Oluwa Ake, who is a Nigerian of the Yoruba ethnic group, born in Lagos State, originally trained in fashion design. Shola's practice uh, focuses on using Yoruba storytelling methods to speak into issues regarding the Black. I tell God, I go go get it real soon, okay? What do you think? How's it doing? Interesting. Uh, uh, in her environment, and depict narratives that are befitting of Black bodies through dance, song, ways of wearing, and poetry. And then the final couplet is Avi Farber who is a trans, uh, transdisciplinary designer and multimedia artist working with wildfires, ceramics, documentary photography, 3D printing, new media sound, uh, and based in New Mexico, US. And then finally, we have Shinwei Che, who's an installation artist who looks at the residue of time through domestic materials and the phenomenology of space. Okay. And then before we pass it off to Julie, a big thank you to the Canadian Association of Graduate Studies, a special, special thank you to you, Ian, to Ellie, uh, to the organizers of this amazing conference and giving our students an opportunity to share their work. I would like to thank the student speakers, thank your communities, thank your supporters, and also my dear colleagues, Natalie Carr, uh, all of you in graduate studies, you keep us alive, you keep us thoughtful, and you model a life of care and understanding. Big shout out to my colleagues, Associate Dean Justin Langlois, Associate Dean Catherine Gillison, and colleagues Caitlin Akins and Lee Gillard. All right, that said, I think we're ready. Julie, you want to take it away? Thank you, Stephen, for that warm and lovely introduction. I'll just go ahead and share my screen. And maybe Stephen, can you give a thumbs up if you can see it and it looks okay? Great, thank you. Um, my name is Julie Van Ooyen, and I'm a master's candidate for a Master of Design in Interaction Design at Emily Carr. 
And today I have some thoughts, examples, and questions about how we might produce creative research together within our more than human systems in order to reinforce relationships of care and mutual responsibility. The contexts for this research are those which we all share, but experience differently and are responsible to in different ways. There are multiple stacking and ongoing ecological crises, systems of racialized oppression, white supremacist colonial systems, and the ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic. And to navigate, transform, survive, and take care of each other within these contexts, my research praxis engages with questions of how we might remain responsible to place, to our communities, and how to enact this in real and tangible ways, if only in small ways. Myself and the humans and non-humans I work with engage with these questions via methods, including material practices of fermentation, writing, drawing, interface design and embodied research methods and theories of emergence, resilience, care and place-based responsibility. The core theories guiding this work are many and the richest lineages are coming from intersectional feminist and non-white, non-Western theories of embodiment as well as some phenomenologist perspectives. Of great influence on my work recently are Adrian Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy, Merlot Ponty's uh, Subjective Bodily Self or the Flesh, uh, ways in which we are connected to others uh, through being alive and interconnected as one large living life matrix, um, and Okanagan scholar Jeanette Armstrong, um, who refers to or who relates how in the Okanagan language they uh, refer to humans as flesh of the land or the bodies uh, of the land. As mentioned previously, something my process revolves around closely is a question of how to care for and be responsible to place. And this starts with knowing who I am, where I am and where I'm from. I'm the daughter of Dutch and Scottish immigrants and settlers living and working on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And my body was formed of and fed by the lands within the territories of the Okanagan Nation and the Insulchin language region. In my work, how can I be aware of this? How, as an uninvited guest, can I enact good relations and be responsible to the places others care for too? How can I honor those relationships to land and to each other? The first of two projects I'll mention today involved expanding notions of community to the microbes within a material fermentation practice and expanding notions of what my own body is from individual human exceptional above other beings to microbial landscape and interface of myriad forms of life and life making activities. The project explored human microbial communities nested within each other, entangled in our mutual dependencies for life. A much larger and relational view of community emerged and the living systems that we are inextricable from became implicated in my own practice. The second project is an open digital publication which responded to a CAGS call last year actually, in which multiple collaborators, including myself um, and also Avi and Shola here today, explored through writing and visual offerings, how we might care with each other in small ways during times of global crises. In total, there were eight collaborators that contributed to this document, the writing and the visuals. In doing so, we built a community of care and kinship through the development of the work during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, actually in the onset when we were all kind of in limbo, implicating ourselves into relationships of mutual responsibility with each other. In engaging with care and responsibility to place and community, I continually seek ways to enact this through the work itself or to stay with the trouble after Donna Haraway. This often involves trying, failing, being accountable to this, listening, learning, and allowing the drift of the project for something better to emerge. 
For example, in my fermentation practice, the work became more about my own labor to sustain the ferments than theirs to sustain me. No obvious designed outcome really emerged from this project other than possibly myself, which as the human in the interaction possibly had the most ground cover, the most to change. In the microcare project, um, a smaller core group of the larger collective, um, a smaller core group that was all white to begin with, uh, wrote a paper about the document that we produced last summer. And it was accepted by an international design conference, uh, Cumulus. And um, when it was accepted, we um, kind of were given some uh, revision requests and some time to make revisions. And during that time, uh, we had further review from another collaborator who became a co-author of this paper itself, Jackie Shaw, um, because they actually flagged when they reviewed the paper about the project that um, it was pretty clear that the paper had failed to represent how truly intersectional the perspectives were and how much richness continues to come from the BIPOC and queer collaborators in the emergent work. So as part of our revision process, we included a subsection where we had a Q&A with Jackie about um, how it felt to work on the microcare project in the beginning and how caring it was and how the uh, open publication that was created kind of really was this, this archive of, of caring acts and thoughts. And then how this paper kind of, um, you know, in in an effort to be seen by an international institution kind of uh, became sanitized and, and lost that feeling and how we could continue the emergent process of this work in this paper itself by adding the subsection. So instead of back editing the paper to include the things that were missing, we decided to present the critique as an additional subsection to open it up and show what happened and the harms that were done. And I'll um, just read Jackie's answer to the question, why does it matter to present it this way? Because they say it better than I could ever say it myself. Jackie Shaw. I'm interested in breaking the format of, this is a finished project, this is what we did. I'm interested in how we can build and share skills around intersectional analysis and intentional intersectional approaches. How do we make those more explicit? Instead of just talking about designing with and designing for transformation, we can practice that today. The decolonizing of design keeps coming up. How can we actually practice that while responding to these kind of calls within institutional settings, which may be at the same time upholding systemic barriers rather than dismantling them? So this is a question that I'm left with as I continue my work, thinking about how we can actually be transformation, enact transformation in our practice and in the, even in meta ways in the things that come out of the practice, such as further publications and keep that work ongoing. And I invite you to think about that too. Thank you very much. Um, I will pop my email into the chat after this. If anyone has any questions or thoughts or comments, I would love to hear them. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. That's amazing. Ahmed? We'll go straight into you and then we'll um, moderate a mini conversation between both of you. Sure, hi. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you everyone for attending this webinar. So I'm going to screen share. Yeah. So I acknowledge that I present my research as a guest to the land on the unceded territories of Coast Salish, uh, the Coast Salish people, people including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and I'm grateful for that. Here, I'm going to present my recent project, which is ongoing. In order to discuss my current research that engages historical narratives of colonialism, I need to take a step back and provide a brief account of my practice as an artist. After some years of working as a practicing artist, I know that the material of my work comes from my immediate environment. I constantly reflect on my interaction with my surroundings. When this environment changes, naturally the content and form of my work follow through. This pattern was most prominent around the time of my relocations from Tehran to Zurich in 2017 and from Zurich to Vancouver in 2019. 
Since arriving in Canada, while trying to learn about my new environment, I was constantly exposed to discussions about colonialism. I gradually decided to further research this complex subject, its mechanisms, its histories, and its power relations. Same old story is a result of this research. In this project, I have attempted to develop a global topology of anti-colonial movements and forces in order to better understand the global histories of colonization. My main inquiry here is what are the possibilities for creating a model that puts different narratives of colonialism in conversation with each other? Can such juxtapositions or contours produce an expanded understanding of decolonization? My process is informed by journalism and archival research. I enjoy merging the role of the artist with that of a historian. I am curious about the similarities in the patterns of exerting power relations between the colonizer and the colonized. In this regard, my process is informed by Edward Said's theories on the role of construction in the formation of historical narratives, specifically as he, his ideas have been taken up by critiques such as Joseph Massad and Hamid Debashi. I specifically utilize the theory that Said provides to study the dynamism of the relations between the colonizer and the colonized. Since my previous works incorporated the institutional spaces, I continue to remain sensitive to institutional dealings. I won't go through my previous project here because of time. This led my research toward areas where the architecture reflects the historical experience of colonialism. In my research, I realized one of the strategies that colonial forces adopt in their quest for domination is to use monuments and buildings to impose their presence on the land, both literally and metaphorically. I became interested in analyzing how the qualities of a building or a neighborhood perpetuate colonial power relations. The drawing component of this work consists of six different superimposed renderings based on, archival, uh, based on archival photos of the sites of the, these events that are laser engraved together on one canvas. I am curious about the conditions of the buildings as a site of these historical narratives. Empty spaces devoid of people that carry the weight of political events that perpetuated colonialism in one way or another. The drawing that are made by digital line tracing is selection of photos. I specifically include different superimposed drawings in one piece to put these diverse events in conversation with each other, emphasize the multi perspectives involved in the events and the eligibility of history. In building opaque landscapes, my work is informed by utopian American artist Julie Meritu, whose practice involves the superimposition of diverse types of drawings. The six historical events that I have chosen to include in this work are the anti colonial speech of Patrice Lumumba, the first prime minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo, at the ceremony of the proclamation. Pro proclamation of the Congo's independence in Palais de la Nation in Kinshasa, the urban war that occurred during the Battle of Algiers as a part of the Algerian War of Independence between France and the Algerian National Liberation Front, secret negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization happening in Norway that resulted in Oslo Accords, the negotiation of an oil concession between Britain and Iran that granted exclusive rights to oil prospects for Britain for 60 years. The destruction of the old summer palace by Anglo-French forces during the opium wars in China. And the construction of the tiny houses in the path of the coastal gasoline pipeline in northern BC as a form of resistance of wet certain people. To add to the livelihood of the narratives and to encourage an intimate connection to the work, I decided to add sound to the project. 
the audio component, which is based on, on, on uh, online archival sounds, uh, following a similar logic, consists of six channels with each sound related to a single event coming from a separate speaker. With same old story, the aim is to combine drawing and sound to stimulate a fictional situation as if all the events are happening at the same time. I will post a link to the sound of this work um, after my presentation. I'm drawn to the idea of cacophony. I do not intend to pri prioritize my personal narrative over others as I relay the story associated with me as a part of a collection of different voices. By including several voices in my work, I'm inspired by the work of Canadian artist Ken Lam, specifically, there is no place like home. Finally, in order to provide some information about the events and also to bridge between drawing and sound, I have included captions of each drawing in a supplementary booklet for visitors' reference. In the process of laser engraving, I could learn how to set the machine to increase the possibility of burning the canvas and to create holes, as well as how to control and shape these bearings. I particularly like this specific treatment because process as I found burning, destruction, and elimination in harmony with the history and trajectory of colonialism. Although I had not predicted that my work would move towards sociopolitical concepts and discussions of history, I can see how this research has helped me expand my knowledge into socio-historical concerns. I enjoy the multidisciplinary approach to, this, to my practice and being able to engage with different fields of knowledge. I'm going to end my presentation with a quote uh, to Matthew Buckingham. Buckingham says, when we consider past events, we are not so much returning to another time and retrieving material or events. We are restaging those events here and now in order to think about what's happening here and now to think about the present. Thank you. That was amazing, Hamed. Excellent. So I'm going to do one question, and this is this is the fun part where the, the whole kind of intention with the the coupling is to create understand affinities, but also detours. You know, so thinking about the through line is really essential here. Um, <clears throat> so one question I have is my observation: if we were to do a mashup, uh, uh, Julie Hamed, uh, is I think both of you have a practice that is about counter clearing. If we think about Frank Walderson's notion of clearing as, as a way of a colonial erasure, you know, you clear the land, you clear the history, you clear to sort of make room for colonial expansion or capitalist expansion. I feel like both of you insist on an ethics and in a practice to not just remember, but to hold a recovery. You know, I think Julie in your work, fermentation as a foil to sanitization is awesome. How exciting is that, right? And then uh, Hamed, your work in terms of thinking about ideas of construction, or even this idea of the same old stories, there's going to be the repetition of the same old story over and over again, where monuments get held, uh, struggle gets reproduced, there is a, a insistence for a type of reappearance to make sure history doesn't, uh, the, win the victors of history don't clear. So my question to you is like, do you see that as a calling? Just making sure that um, there's a deep historical expanse in your work and, and a deep commitment for this type of historical continuity? Big question. It can just be yes or no, I guess, at this point, and then we can move on to the next round. <laughs> Any thoughts? So, Julie, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, thanks, Hamid. Um, yeah, I think, like you mentioned, uh, Stephen, fermentation as kind of the opposite of sanitization is really interesting. And I think both my fermentation practice and the documents that I've been collaborating on have constantly tried to continue this like thickening of um, kind of what community means and who gets to create work and whose work gets to be um, centered or put forward. And it's this like ongoing process of, and I don't know, 
this might be kind of like niche to people who've been working with ferments like me and I'm maybe still embedded in that but you know when you have like a kombucha scoby and it uh kind of builds builds up and thickens and eventually you can like peel it and then it kind of proliferates that way that's what happens anyway it's oversimplified but I kind of like this idea of like making thicker and messier conversations and keeping everyone in it even people who are kind of you know creating the work or doing the research and I think it's so important to implicate ourselves in that always because it keeps us responsible to each other and it requires us to bring who we are to the process and acknowledge who we are and what our positionality is so I like just kind of making that messier and it's definitely kind of a departure from wanting it to be clean and you know white walls and that kind of thing wonderfully put and then any thoughts yeah I, I like the, the word clearing that you mentioned that you brought up and by that I want to refer to decolonize decolonizing and um, I'm constantly reflecting on this term how to decolonize what decolonization mean and what are the best methods of decolonization I also like the term Julie used uh, ma making it messier I really enjoyed it and this is how I try to achieve in my drawings to make messy drawings because I think one of the possibilities that we have in terms of art is um, there's a level of abstraction involved. So uh, my, my idea is um, I don't want uh, to ground my audience. Uh, I don't, I wanna suspend my audience in uh, the space between connecting to the work and disconnecting from the work. And I think abstraction helps us in order to um, not fall into uh, traps of col col colonization. I think, I think uh, representational uh, art can easily fall into, can easily be colonized. And I get advantage from this messiness, making the work messier or making the work more abstract in order to avoid that. And I look at it as a method of decolonization. That makes That's sense. Great. Awesome. Good. Wonderful start. Really great. Um, so excited. Thanks, you two. All right, let's pass it to the next round. There'll be an opportunity for more lateral questioning and answer answering or just dialogue. So who we have next is um, Gemma and Shola. And again, for those of you in the audience who have headphones, plug them in. I'm going to do that now. And everyone, let's remember eight minutes. Uh, so just to make sure we have room for um, uh, conversation later on. All right, Gemma, take it away. Hey everyone, I'm Gemma. I'm just gonna get some video started and I will be speaking over the video. You get a live voiceover. Um, can everyone see this video? Great. So, I have been investigating the concept of embodiment through creating kinesthetic empathy. What you're looking at right now is a recent installation called Breathing Room. There are seven different ideas in the room, each with a different duration ranging from two minutes to 40 minutes. And these ideas are constantly coinciding in new ways as they loop through their own cycles. I. Uh, I recorded my own breath under different circumstances and then played it back differently around the room. So you should have some sound coming up soon. I also created this write-up about breath and I encouraged people to read it out loud. I took out all the punctuation and made each sentiment a little bit longer than the last so that as you read, 
the time between each breath is extended and you're forced to take deeper breaths, making the audience more aware of their own breath and also creating an embodied experience from the concepts around them. So you'll see my face for a, for a moment here. I've recently begun working exclusively with sound um, in an effort to further create that embodied experience without any visual cues. My hope is that the experience is sort of rerouted through the body when what is commonly a dominant sense is removed. So I have a little sound excerpt for you from my recent project called Sound Escape, which was an experiment in creating the sensation of movement in space and in the body of the listener only using auditory cues. I wanted someone to be able to put on headphones and feel like they were moving and to be able to sense movement in the space and other bodies around them. So I'm gonna drop this link to SoundCloud in the chat. It's just two minutes um, and please use headphones. This is your cue now to put those headphones in. It's um, not quite the same without them. And feel free to turn off your cameras and we'll meet back here when you're done. Okay, I think you can still hear me. So if you're just finishing up and navigating back here, I'll, uh, I'll start and you can listen. So what you just heard was a binaural recording. I wore these two little in-ear binaural microphones while I moved my body in space with recorded sound being played back through speakers. I used a technique called source blocking which means that I'm obstructing the source of the sound from the recorder. And since the actual source blocking was a dynamic object, my own body moving in space, it's the changes in the quality of sound that are describing the movement through uh, uh, to us through sound. I call these sound shadows. And what they do is they make us imagine what we would be seeing creating the sound. And what I like about this is that it is the viewer determining the scene for themselves and they're basing it on their other senses. But what I'm really excited about is the idea that with greater specificity, these sounds can perceptually rematerialize movement in space. So I had to ask myself, am I trying to make sound holograms? 
Yes, <laughs> I think I am. Part of my research into sound and embodiment is in proximity. So what transpires between people and is it reliant on physical proximity and can it be sensed from afar? I've been researching the theory of brainwave synchronization, which is the premise of binaural beats, where our brains match the different frequencies and headphones to reach a different state, whether it's uh, to be more focused or relaxed. I'm also interested in co-regulation from polyvagal theory, which is basically what happens in various types of therapy. So if I was the patient, my nervous system would regulate itself to match my therapist's more regulated system. I will actually be, be developing this project in a residency with Loeb Spatial Sound Studio, which is only one of three spatial sound studios in the world to use a new sound technology called 4D Sound. Um, and it's here in Vancouver. They have these vibro transducers in the floors so that you, actually, you can actually feel the vibration of sound. And um, what 4D Sound allows you to do is actually divide sound and distribute it in space. So the bigger question I'm asking with embodiment is the extent to which our bodies are affected by other bodies. And with this project, I'm exploring how this can be translated across time and space. Thank you. Thanks, Gemma, that was amazing. Got some info here That's too. Great. Perfect. Um, Shola. Hmm. Can you see my screen? Good, okay. okay. First, I want to acknowledge that I live and work and I'm uninvited on the on Cedar Coast Salish territories, the ancestral lands of the Sabertooth, Squamish, Zulu, Zuminos, and Musqueam nations. I acknowledge that I am uninvited and this status humbles me to approach this with caution. I present this body of work in this manner with the awareness of your resilience and the misdeeds done to you by many, especially colonial masters for we share links in our histories with them. I greet you first and honor you. I am here to tell you about stories and how they played a role in my thesis project so I have titled my presentation, Ahondudu Yoruba Storytelling as Research. My name is Uluwa Shola Kendi Uluwaki, and I am from Nigeria and of the Yoruba ethnic group. I grew up on stories and it was through the oral practice of Yoruba storytelling that my parents taught me about life. We refer to these stories as alo in Yoruba language, which some of you might know as folk tales or tales by the moonlight. Um, and with these stories, elders of the family go and teach younger ones about life. This is the subjectivity that I, approach, I approached my project with. And so before I came to Vancouver, I was told that it was diverse and it was a multicultural place. And this led me to expect a lot of things from this place that I was coming to. But on arrival here, I realized that I started to feel a lack of Black communal culture here. Um, and it finally heightened last year when I began to have conversations within the community that I had joined and I was a part of about race, the Black Lives Matter movement and police brutality. Um, I was having these conversations and it just seemed like there was this unwillingness to create space for Black us, so Black people, as we voiced our concerns. This led me to uncover some barriers that I experienced between myself and the people that I met. And so for my thesis, I marked out these barriers and wrote stories out of them. They are Deniali, Facade Diversity, and Boss Glass. In case you're wondering, yes, they're spelled in Yoruba language. And these stories further illustrate my experience with these different barriers. So what I learned over 2020 was that conversations I was having, even if I was not really planning to have them, were not working. 
Um, so I spent the rest of my degree trying to figure out another way to communicate, which is through storytelling. I created a character called Ahondudu. Ahondudu is me, a character in my stories and my Yoruba subjectivity that lives and exists in Vancouver. Um, and through your, the Yoruba storytelling framework I spoke about earlier, I was able to recount my experiences in order to share with this environment. The summary of the story is basically that Ahondudu is told by the rain spirit to go and warn everybody in within his own land, the mountain called Uki. And as he goes, he encounters all these barriers. Um, and later, the king orders that he's thrown off the mountain because no one is listening to him. He warns the people with the song. Egbamio Bami, if he cow can la Bami, if he cow can la Bami, if he cow can la Bami, Egbamio Bami, if he cow can la Bami, if he cow can la Bami, if he cow can la Bami. So the storytelling over and over again with words also involved song, dance, and movement. And I was doing this because I was practicing how to use the spectacle to communicate. My use of the spectacle was borrowed from a Yoruba festival we call Gelede, which is a festival that uses performance to also teach and entertain. And so I went back to my fashion design training and design garments to do exactly just that, to teach and entertain. The garments were made as a response to body movement and dance and serving as visual narratives for each of the stories. In my story, Ahondudu is given these garments by his own people um, as he goes to warn everyone else on Uki. And they too serve as components of the story. They're, if you may, like visual carriers of the story. And so of what relevance is Yoruba storytelling and the spectacle to us here now, well, these stories are stories about what has been experienced, what needs to be acknowledged and addressed in Vancouver. The spectacle company it draws people in and it calls people to listen. Each story is named by its problem and it highlights the effects of the issue in question. So denial, the story would highlight that denial is a problem because there is no space to holistically express the pain that comes with anti-Black racism or injustices of many kinds, because they're simply first and foremost just untrue. But the second story, this marks out the form of complacency that exists in Vancouver and was something that I experienced constantly. Like there's this general belief that Vancouver is diverse simply because it has different ethnic identities present here. This story highlights that this complacency does not really allow for more intimate and relational ways of community building. And thirdly, for the glass box, the story highlights that this is a problem because the white lens, from my experience, will not accept racism in the Black experience because of its own lack of experience of it. You might hear people say, I have never witnessed it before, therefore it doesn't exist, which perpetrates white supremacy. These stories remind us about complexities and the issues present in our environment, and they point us to the fact that Actually, this might not just be affecting me, but it may also be a common story among people of color. Ahon, Dudu and I, we invite hearers of this story to be companions of it. I really hope to do workshops through this to further um, investigate and to call for further engagement with these stories that people become true companions of it and learn how to engage through exhibitions, workshops and other media. To end, I remember how falling off the mountain felt. My body was already exhausted from all the running. And although I was very close to death, I didn't feel dead. In fact, I was very conscious that I was alive. And when Ojo, the rain spirit, showed me the smoke, I realized that me falling was a parallel to what OK and everyone in it became. Nothing.
Thank you. Any question? This is amazing. What a great second round. Thank you, Shola. Thank you, Gemma. Wow. Um, all right, through line, through line. Let's see how we can make connections and, and um, uh, make things more complex. And to use the word last time, make things a little more messy. Uh, I, one practical sort of biographical question I have for both of you. Uh, both of you have different origin stories in terms of your um, academic uh, journey. Right, Gemma, you were trained as a dancer and, and filmmaker, am I right? Shola, fashion. So question number one is how did those original sort of disciplinary exposures, how did you build off, extend, complicate that origin in your current work? And then the second question I think is about, this one is, is deeper, I'm trying to, uh, I mean, Shola, I love, I love the stories of, I mean, I don't love them, but I, I find them so, beautiful but so precise the stories of denial the stories of the facade the stories of the glass box right so it seems like you're trying to insist on a other stories that get erased or not reproduced and then Gemma your insistence that sensation can lead to other ways of knowing right so we live in quarantine right now and it seems like uh, I miss going outside in public and hearing you know, people gathering. I miss the sounds of, of the public square. I miss radios blasting. How can artists sort of insist on different types of presence as a way of, of, of social transformation? Broad question. First one is just like, tell me about your origin and how that kind of uh, uh, impacts your work. And the second is like, what do you hope artists can do when thinking about the, this idea of sensation and story? It's big. Um, I can start. Uh, I love that you brought up the word presence because that's what I've been working with a lot lately. And that's really um, what, what I took from dance and, and put into my filmmaking and I'm still using now is the ability to record an event and replay it and then create sort of layered presence through that. Like this is you know, a different experience, but it's affected by what's already happened. Um, and what was the second question? Uh, I can't remember the second question. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. You know, like uh, dance became sort of introduced the vocabulary of other formations of presence. So my, my second question is really about like, how, why do, how do artists and designers, uh, uh, um, um, how can they experiment with different socialities or different presences or different ways of sense making, I guess. Yeah. But maybe the way the entry to that conversation is sort of your or origin story. So Shola, any kind of want to expand on how your initial, uh, I mean, even in your bio, I, I love your bio, like sort of how um, um, storytelling and fashion and um, uh, how ways of wearing is also a practice in a, in a sense, right? So how, how did your original um, degree, how did it complicate your practice now? Oh, sure, thanks for that question. I, so when I studied fashion design, I initially wanted to be a bridal designer, but everything changed when I started studying culture in fashion because I started realizing all the, um, let's say baggage for lack of a better word that, that really came with that industry and that that tag fashion design and so I increasingly got um, disinterested or uninterested in actually going into the industry and so I got more interested in how fabric and how garments could serve as pathways to stories that we're telling that I was telling that that were actually more important to me than just making 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 so that I could sell because it seemed like what was going on still in this a Western context um, with the Black race and with Black people um, was more important to speak about. And so I come from a place where almost everything has meaning down to the clothes that you wear and the symbols you use on like tie and dye and adure. So um, I, I kind of just really morphed more into 
where I was coming from. I really took that Yorubaness of like putting meaning to symbols and fabrics and really putting that out to people to say, this is the story that I'm trying to um, tell. So that's, that's where we are. <laughs> that's awesome. That's great. I think both of you sort of demonstrate that crossover and really trying to make sure that public space is, is not monoculture, right? <laughs> you know, we need different experiences and how that allows different worldings in a way. This is great. Okay, so let's pass to the next uh, set. So we have Avi and then Shinwei. All right, good morning. Thanks for those great presentations. Just gonna navigate to my screen here. Uh, all right, can everyone see my screen all right? I actually just need to minimize this box. Okay. Okay, so my name is Avi Farber. I'm gonna give a quick presentation uh, on my thesis work here, Making Kin with Wildfire, which is a relational design practice. And um, my work really uh, dives into my relationship with the land, with more than human and emerging technologies. And as part of that, I just wanna acknowledge uh, all the peoples whose land this took place on, unceded Coast Salish territories here in the Vancouver area. Uh, as well as in Washington, where I was working on Point Roberts, the territories of the Mountain Maidu near Quincy, California, and the territories of the Hickory Apache, the Comanche, the Pueblos, and the Ute down in New Mexico. Uh, indigenous knowledge has really shaped this project and it shaped me in the process. Uh, and so I think it's really important to begin to think about how we relate to the land and how it has been, uh, I guess, colonized. I want to tell you the story about this object and how I know the land through it. This is a 3D printed uh, ceramic flask that I fired in a wildfire. And it's a metaphorical object that I use to think about how we relate, uh, I guess, to wildfire, but also to emerging technologies and uh, a way of carrying new stories in the object and also metamorphosing them uh, through the firing. I'll start with just a little bit of context where I come from. I'm, I'm from uh, Northern New Mexico down in the United States. And before coming to graduate school, I was part of a wood fire pottery community that gathered at these kilns a couple of times a year and fires with wood. All of the pots are stacked into the kiln and you fire uh, for a week at a time. And during that period, you really develop a relationship with fire. So this is looking into the kiln. As you fire and stoke, you feel uh, the energy of the fire and you build a relationship with it because you're slowly trying to move heat through the kiln to get to a certain temperature so that all the pots have uh, like a beautiful sheen to them. And when the work come out of the kiln, they, they can kind of captivate you. These are two potters looking at a piece that's just come out. And this is the fire moving through the kiln as it's touching the wares. At the same time, I was working with fire in the kiln. I was also working with fire in the landscape as a wildland firefighter. And I was building a relationship uh, with fire in the landscape. I really like this, this image that I shot of one of my fellow firefighters because you see the complexity of the environment and how the fire is kind of going back into the depths. And for me, it makes us question how we relate to fire. We have a lot of different relationships with fire and wildfire especially because it, it can threaten our communities, but we can also get lost in it. And wildland firefighters, I think, have a deep admiration for fire as well. Uh, it's not solely fear. So my work is really about trying to think how we might be able to reframe how we think about fire, but also engage it, the energy of it, uh, the more in the human nature of it in our design practices. Um, Jeanette Armstrong is an educator, says, in the Okanagan, our understanding of the land is that it's not just that we're part of the land. It's not just that we are part of the vast system that operates on the land, but the land is us. 
In our language, the word for our bodies contains the word for the land. Uh, Julie brought this up in talking about the flesh of the earth is us in her presentation. I like thinking about it too, um, how fire is part of the land and how if we're all connected, how we can build a relationship with fire, a deeper relationship with fire that might connect us uh, to the places around us and how we might know them. Um, I was curious how I could give spirits of clay and fire agency in my design practice. Uh, so here is a video of me in Point Roberts, Washington. Uh, as I was developing a new practice in this new place, moving to graduate school, one of the ways I did that was rooting down and going out and harvesting clay. And I took this clay and I was learning technology, uh, putting it through the 3D printers. So here's just a video of this kind of homemade 3D printer making a vessel. Uh, this is a similar shape to the vessel that you saw at the start of the presentation that I uh, put in wildfires. Um, the connection between 3D printing uh, and my project hinges on Re Ronald Rayall's uh, understanding of the two. And he says that this merging of paradigms has the potential to advance the cultural legacy of clay in an era where the machine and body work hand in hand. And I'm really curious how technology can either bring us closer to the land or develop a relationship with the land or maybe pull us away from, from an understanding or, or um, reciprocity with how we treat the places where we live. Um, so as the potter's hands ground them in practice, I think it's important to think of the use of our hands and the way they connect us to the, to the land. And when you're 3D printing, obviously your hands are taken out of, out of or maybe abstracted in the process. So I'm curious if these technologies disembody our relationship with the land and what the implications might be. Uh, I'm engaging these emerging technologies to explore how they affect our relationship with the land in this era of automization. Um, and I don't have much more time left, but uh, my project hinges on the idea of thinking about how the objects we make uh, affect the world that we live in. And so part of my research was going into areas that had been impacted by wildfires. So not just looking at the uh, relationship with firefighters, but thinking about how our designed uh, places are, are affected by wildfires and how our objects might mediate that relationship. So by placing uh, the flasks into these burned areas or areas that were gonna be burned, I'm trying to uh, create connections between those worlds. Here's just a couple pictures from these ruins in Berry Creek, California, where I was doing some of my research. Um, and Anna Singh says, we're stuck with the problem of living despite economic and ecological ruination. Neither tales of progress nor of ruin tell us how to think about collaborative survival. It's time to pay attention to mushroom picking. Not that this will save us, but it might open our imaginations. And she uses the matutake mushroom uh, as a way to uh, critique people who are left out of capitalist systems, but also to rise out of a human damaged planet. So uh, in my current work, I'm using ash and other materials that I'm harvesting in these places to think about how we might, I guess in a sense, rise out of the ashes of these places, but how we might create something beautiful and think of uh, new futures that can come from this. So I think I'm a little over time, so I'll stop there. But if you're more curious in my work, uh, this is my master's thesis that you'll be able to see on the Emily Carr Library website soon. So thanks a lot. Amazing, Avi. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's beautiful, moving. All right, Shinwei, take it away. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm going to uh, start by sharing a short video recording and then I'll speak over it. So I'll share my screen. Okay. Uh, so my central research question is, how can we experience time that escapes this entanglement with capitalist extraction? Um, so we're looking at uh, a short clip of a recent work called Holding. Um, and I'll be talking a bit more about this work in my practice as the video plays. Um, 
I would, I have always been really drawn to thinking about our relationship with time because uh, we're often so pressed for time. Like I've never, like, I can't remember ever like encountering someone who's like, I have too much time. Like, you know, what's my problem having too much time? Like people talk about spending time or like buying time or like saving time, but really rarely do we get to really experience time. So I um, developed this performance installation uh, during which I inhabited um, like 40 work hours by attending to these candle flames um, of these flex candles uh, and also applying these pigments that I made from uh, traditional Chinese herbal medicine. Uh, so during this time for eight hours every day, over five days, I held this space open um, for visitors. So I let this clip run uh, quietly for a while. Um, the seeds of my works are often from philosophers uh, and sometimes physicists. During this performance, I kept this reminder um, from Dogen Zenji's Shobo Genzo book with me. So uh, Dogen wrote that the whole existence, the whole universe exists in individual moments of time. Let us pause to reflect whether or not any of the whole of existence or any of the whole universe has leaked away from the present moment of time. So I think words uh, are good reminders for me, uh, but I often find that language, particularly like academic English language, makes many assumptions that define what we can understand or experience. Um, and the two assumptions that I find most limiting for me in my practice are firstly that events happen in a linear chronology. And the second assumption is that we know the answers, or if we don't know the answers, then through rational thinking and objective observations, we can come to know the answers. Um, so to sort of sidestep uh, some of these assumptions that are like built into like academic language, uh, I find that what truly guides my research and making is my relationship with materials. So the properties of my materials shape the processes that I choose to work with in my studio and um, my experience and careful observation of my material processes. Like that's what allows me to discover my ideas and questions. Um, so in the remaining time, I'm going to show this set of slides. Yeah, so in the remaining time, I'll share a bit about wax, which is a material I've worked with for about 10 years. Um, I first became drawn to the material because of its ability to carry the memory of heat through cycles of melting and cooling. I made this work in my second year in undergrad, imagining the shapes of things that fall behind our furniture and become forgotten over time. 
uh, in wax figure museums, wax is used to imitate skin. Yet when you hold wax in your hand for a long time, the heat from your skin softens the wax and causes it to change. Like you leave like your fingerprints like in a wax when you hold it for a long time. Uh, when wax is heated, it's nearly transparent. Like if, that, if there's any material embedded in it, you can see like right through the wax to like all the material detail. But the moment it cools, it becomes only faintly translucent and what's left inside becomes obscured. Uh, before the invention of pendulum clocks, like candles were used as like the primary means to keep track of time in many parts of the world. Um, but the burn time of candles is actually really affected by the temperature, the humidity, the presence of wind, and many other um, not so visible factors in that place. The only physics equation that separates the past from the future is the law of thermodynamics. So that law states that heat can only pass from a hotter body to a cooler one. So heat is times arrow. How many shapes does time have? Hugh Everett's many worlds theory suggests that maybe there could be an infinite number of shapes. Two identical candles can burn at very different rates. Time passes faster in the mountains than it does at sea level. A mass slows time down around itself. In hives, when bees uncap honey, the beeswax cappings drop to the bottom of the hive and these droppings are often reworked into unusual formations by the bees. Um, the beeswax candles that I make drip as they are consumed. And when the entire wick has been used, the residue of the beeswax remaining is melted again to be reformed into another span of time. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, the recording that I shared at the beginning is actually really long. So if you would like to see like a longer duration, just drop me a note in my email. I'll leave my contact information. Would love to hear. That was amazing, Shinwei. Um, Avi Shinwei, it's, it's funny. I, I didn't anticipate so much resonance between both of your work, you know, uh, through fire. <laughs> so my question, is really specific, but I think if if we were, you know, it seems like out of the couples, the coupling, we're we're um, I'm cautious to use the word extracting, but perhaps naming certain operations that all of your work uh, uh, um, participates in, like fermentation, sanitation, disappearance, right, storytelling. In this case, the word burn time popped up for me. You know, what is burn time? In the in Shinwei for your work, burn time is the logic of a candle until it becomes completely expended. And then Avi, your relationship or or your sort of um, postulation that there should be a rethinking in terms of our relationship with fire, you know, I'm wondering if burn time may be a useful thinking, a useful tool. And then what's the connection between burn time? and being burnt out, <laughs> you know? You know, and I think, be, uh, if anything, the past few years, we this is a burnout society, right? We, we're burnt out emotionally, we're literally burnt out. We are burnt out by uh, overworking, you know, in this hyper, hyper overproductive, socially unjust world. So is there a, uh, how might we unpack the word burn time? And even okay. if it's like start, a basic layer. unpacking, yeah. Oh, sure, I can go ahead. Um, so I think burn time for me, like the literal burn time of the candles is making visible like a heat transfer because 
heat transfers are always taking place. Like heat is always moving from hotter bodies to cooler ones, even if I don't light the candle. But because we live like swimming in time and then we are made of time. So it's very hard for us to like make sense of or really like see time. So for me, like the burning of the candle is like making visible something that we are in all the time. Um, and in its relation to like the idea of being burnt out, I think it relates really closely to the performance installation that I showed because like I want to try to use this space and this like time to try to uh, heal my own relationship with time, which I feel like is really fractured and often like almost like violent, like the, like the force of productivity and the need of being productive. And I hope like by opening up the space, maybe like other people can feel in that way, or maybe they would feel some comfort in just knowing that like I am trying to do that with my relationship with time. I think I, it was really nice to see your presentation, Shinwei, and seeing uh, the, the image of the radiator that was covered in wax actually made me think about my work and reinterpret in a way and thinking about like changing of form and um, how we can experience something changing over time. I think for me, that's where it comes into play. So um, like you imagine the wax dripping off the radiator that you've shown and how that changes our experience of that. And I think about uh, being in these communities that have burned and seeing our objects like uh, microbes that are melted or that car, which I had to move through very quickly, but where the radiator has melted out. Um, that transition over time to me of this material reflects something back to us about um, what's happening. And, and I think we can make, maybe those bring broader understanding. So for me, seeing reflections of time through burnt things like melted car parts versus melted candles um, over time helped me to understand them. I think in terms of being burnt out, I like that, um, especially because that's like a, a term I've used for thinking of just objects that are devoid of life after a fire. But I also like to interpret it as, you know, fire has a regenerative nature to it as well. Farmers use fire to regenerate their fields and to bring nutrients back into their fields, right? So um, to me, I think about the balance of that, how uh, when we get burnt out, we maybe nothing is left, or if we leave too little, it's hard to regrow, right? And our forests now, when they burn with intensity that they do now because of how we, the relationship we've had with them for a century, there's almost nothing left. There's no soil left, right? Like there's no nutrients left in the soil and it takes like half a decade for them to regenerate. But um, maybe if we leave a little bit left, if we burn fires more frequently, right? If we use fire to regenerate, then we have like a cycle that we can sustain. So I, I guess I, I like the idea of burnout and how we can maybe manage our burnout by also thinking about how we can use that which is burning us out to also regenerate and start the cycle again. Yeah, Avi, sorry, Stephen. I just wanted to respond a short response to Avi's answer and his words. Um, I, like, I was so excited to hear you talk about like, collecting the clay and using it as a material in your work as a way of getting to know the land. And I felt like it really relates to uh, what Stephen was asking about, like the idea of like burnt out, because that's not something that like a burnt out society does. It's like um, so contrary to like society's ideas about like how we should be using our time, like sourcing our own materials instead of like clicking a button and like getting it here, same day delivery. So I like thinking about those relationships a lot. Thank you. Beautiful. This is amazing. I'm going to open it up to uh, the six speakers to see if you all have any questions for each other. Uh, I, I'm so moved and, and all the presentations have been amazing. I'm really um, uh, speechless in terms of how impactful they are. Uh, but, you know, Hamed, Julie, Shola, Gemma, any, any questions for Shinwei or Avi or vice versa? I think that's a question in the chat, Stephen. Yes. Yep. 
there's a the question from Peggy, um, and it's two questions. Do you consider fire as alive? If so, do you consider fire as a co-author, a co-creator of your work? And what does that mean for you? And maybe if we were to extend on Peggy's question, you know, whether or not collaboration or co-authorship or co-creation is a motif in all of your work as well. I can speak to that quickly, but uh, thanks for the question, Pe Peggy. I would say definitely that's kind of a main part of my project is thinking of fire as alive. I mean, with all the time I've spent with it, you come to see it as like a force that it, it has so much presence to it. And I, I like to almost give personalities to it, different types of personalities when you're working with fire, either in a kiln uh, or out in the landscape. So for me, it's very much a co-creator and it, it's uh, something that I, I learn from, that I take lessons from, I guess. So it really has taught me to decenter um, myself from the work in a sense, like the work doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a reflection of me, but it's a way that I can maybe engage uh, landscapes and the way I'm making in a new way. Yeah, I think like uh, I was, I feel that Fire is my co-collaborator, but also it's like so much bigger than me. Like Avi was like describing, um, I kind of use fire as like a, a tool for a thought experiment in order to experience time in my work because stuff like the, for example, the multi-world theory, which posits that time is constantly splitting, you can intellectualize it, but it's hard to experience it. So I use fire as a tool of like imagining what if when I light the flame, it starts a chronological span of time that I can see. So then when the fire splits up or when they're like multiple flames, like I am using it to experience time. So I think I'm learning from the fire and the behavior of the flame that way. Go for it, Hamed. And then we also have a question from Maria after you're, after you're done, Hamed. I have a question uh, for Avi. Um, you know, we talk about fire and your relationship with fire, but my question is, and maybe you talked about it and I didn't get it. But my question is, do you also um, think about the source of fire and fire out of wood or out of oil or out of gas? And I asked this question in terms of like global warming and those kind of concerns. Is it, does it matter uh, how the fire is made or what is the source of your fire you make? Yeah, yeah I, so I think that, thanks Samit, that's a great question for me. Uh, I experienced that in making pottery and I, I was fortunate to start making pottery in, in those wood fired kilns, which I showed, which for me had so much more life and energy to the work than just firing a kiln with electricity, you know, or firing it with natural gas uh, in so many ways. But um, for me, it, it does matter because there's a deeper relationship that comes with, for me, with making fire from wood, especially in a kiln, because it's a relationship over a long period of time versus in a kiln where you hit a button and it you know, fires up. And I think the important thing is that with wood, not that it's a, like, you could say a lot about sustainability or how it's unsustainable because of the particulates, but it's a direct relationship that I have with the fire coming from that source versus, right? Because I go out into the woods and when I'm back home, I'll harvest the wood and it'll go through the kilns and then it'll make ash that falls on the pots that makes the glaze, right? So it's the fire is kind of coming through the whole process versus when I hit a button in a kiln, I don't know about the power plant that's creating the electricity that's driving that fire that's in that kiln. You know, For me, it's, it's a more complex form of, of a relationship. Yeah, great, thank you. Perfect, and we have a question from Maria. Um, I like how air, fire, and earth were, were represented in these talks and uh, wondering about how Shola and Gemma might position uh, themselves in these elements as well. Um, I'm inclined to think of them all from the perspective of the felt sense. Um, for example, earth is where we generate our, our sense of vibration. 
um, the earth actually has its own vibrational resonance. It's called the Schumann resonance. And it's basically remnants of lightning that keeps reverberating around the earth. Um, sound, of course, is, sorry, air, of course, is, um, is how I like to describe sound. Like, how else does this transfer? You can feel you can feel air when the wind is blowing. You can hear sound when there's something a little bit different registering. So different frequencies in music or sound we're causing, but there's always sound around us, whether or not we can, we can actually perceive it. Um, and then fire, I, I think of fire as time as well. And time is a really big element in everything I do. Um, whether it's movement, film, or sound, it's I'm always working with a time-based medium. And that's how I create the experience. That's how I bring the audience along with what's happening. And so we're all kind of changed in some way from beginning to end. Oh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I was like listening to you and like, mm, yeah. <laughs> Um, for me, how I think I see all these elements, for me, earth is like, reminds me of place. Um, and I said earlier that I'm from Nigeria, but I'm in Vancouver, but I've also schooled in the UK. So there are all these different places that um, I, I, I sort of like carry along with me. And so in my stories, especially for this one that I shared, I am constantly going back between um, my Nigerian identity, the Nigerian place, the Yoruba place and Vancouver and like switching between those two. So I kind of see it as like living between those um, different contexts. But for, uh, for fire, I think of it more so like metaphorically or like, uh, what's the word? I don't know, through story form. And so how fire might represent something like trouble or like, danger you know I see it as um appearing in my stories in that sense too as in the fire of racism or the fire that racism would would start a fire that police brutality might start or the fire that might come up for it to warn people that something is coming and in terms of air um <laughs> I guess these past few months um um haven't really felt like clear breathing space. So it's more so of like the effects of feeling choked because of the social atmospheric, I guess, context of where our world is right now. So I, I kind of see those elements weaving in like that quite metaphorically, but also like present in my own reality. Estrella, uh, thanks for that uh, intervention and, and complication in addition to thinking about fire immediately thought about James Baldwin's the fire next time you know so which is a warning uh, a precaution and like if we don't change uh, there will be a fire next time so it kind of complicates things and it kind of goes to Hamed's point the same Hamed's work like same old story the sort of repetition of, of cycle and crises right uh, wonderful wonderful all right question from Justin in the queue um, I'm interested in hearing a bit from any all of panelists about the ways in which you think about research and practice and what value or limit or limitations arise in combining or conflating those terms. Is it important to think, uh, to think of creative practice as research? Are there things in your practices that might be useful to translate to other disciplines beyond art and design? Julie. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Justin. Um, when I think of research and creative practice sitting next to each other, I think personally that um, creative practice can become a research praxis if it's enacting materially or tangibly uh, with theory. So it's a way to um, kind of go between theories, even from other disciplines, other ways of knowing, and then um, interacting with those in a material way. And as a designer, um, I'm not necessarily the like artisan fermenter or something like that, but I kind of um, engage with craft and creative tactics to explore ideas and then document those. And I see the, the two kind of 
being in dialogue as research creation. Um, and sometimes there might be limitations to that. Um, um, as we've kind of, each of us have mentioned, there are, you know, academia is itself an institution that has deep colonial roots. And so um, by keeping the idea of research with a capital R um, tied to creative practice that could possibly have a choking effect to the practitioner, to the uh, work itself. So um, I think it's important to, in each space, think about what it can really offer and is it more important to just let the creative practice flourish uh, without that maybe? I don't know if anyone else has a comment on that. Ahmed, go for it. Yeah, to answer Justin's question, I would say um, definitely um, it's important that we think our creative practice as research, but I wanna highlight the fact uh, that there is a, a flexibility in terms of research methods in creative research. And uh, it's been, I mean, as artists and designers, uh, uh, um, we, are, um, we are encouraged to create and develop our, our, our own research methods as we go through our work. You know, it's not like following certain research methods. I think it also adapts to other fields, but uh, it's specifically in terms of art and design, flexibility is, is, um, is, is important for us to have. And it's, uh, um, it's the kind of, um, as I said, it's an, it's an element that uh, it's been encouraged. I mean, we are encouraged to do that. And I think, yeah, it's a strong a strength in uh, research creation. Definitely, and, and sort of thinking about the methodologies and the, the search through the creative process opportunistically. Sometimes I feel like um, uh, the degree title is a misnomer, like a master of fine arts, a master of design, as if there's a singular mastery, right? So I think it's much more, uh, uh, this is where the degree title may actually reveal the limitations and where practice may actually exceed the potential. <laughs> Right, so, but thank you. Sorry. Can I um, jump in like a short thing before we move on from this question? Go for it. I just felt yeah. like, because um, I've been thinking about research in relation to like, uh, like our more uh, increasing like awareness of the need to like decolonize. And I think like part of the problem, but also maybe what is valuable to like learn from research is that the best research doesn't like predict the outcome and then like research to prove the outcome like that is the recipe for like a biased um, research process that only affirms what you already think to be true um and i think about that a lot in my practice kind of like setting up the um uh, like material and spatial boundaries but not dictating what will happen to the material processes. So in that way, I am attempting to uh, research in like um, not like a biased way in my own terms, like in my creative practice. Well put, Jingwei. And then we have one more question from Ian. Um, one thing that stands out from these from your presentations is how each of you have worked so hard worked hard to situate yourselves and your experiences in your research you know we were talking about this just now so what would you recommend to graduate students working in other disciplines for example history economics law chemistry who may feel detached or disassociated from the research projects part of it too is that it's like an object subject thing right sometimes a subject and object are not the same <laughs> um, but it, Curious about your thoughts. Or maybe everyone just needs to grow mushrooms. Um, I, can, I can speak to that, I think. Uh, what I love about art is that um, the processing is actually embedded into your practice. So you do your research and then you, you're um, forced to take some time 
where you're activating, whether you're working with your hands or um, doing something else, you have to take this space. And it's in that space that I find I'm connecting ideas and, and connecting things that wouldn't normally be thought of together. And I'm coming up with new ideas. Um, and I, I think that is just maybe formalized in an art practice, but I think there's other ways to um, bring that into different research. And I, I think that's why people enjoy walking and nature and cooking and things like this, where you're in motion, but you're not necessarily having to focus all of your thoughts on what you're doing. And so you're connecting these these things and you're observing and you're reflecting on your memory. So I think that it can, it can, you can sort of bring your research into your own life, but I think there is that time that needs to be taken in order to digest it in a new way. Thanks for that, Gemma. And that, that also talks about, uh, you know, since the work is part of our life, it then sp uh, spills into questions of obligation and community reciprocity. Um, so thank you. Um, I, we have a, oh, Avi, go ahead. I just wanted to speak to that really quickly. I think that one thing that's really nice about art and design is that it dives deeply into relationships. Like when you're a designer, you're thinking about the people you're designing for or, or helping people to design for themselves, right? And so that inherently makes you think about, I think, how you're connected to what you're doing. Um, and really trying to find the, maybe if not the path of least resistance, just the best way to do it so that everyone uh, kind of comes, everyone benefits from the process. Um, so I think in other, uh, other disciplines like history, economics, law, or chemistry, maybe there isn't such a natural or upfront um, way of doing that in that discipline, but I think it's, not too far off if we just think about how we're related to these things, if you dive into the, the relationships. Like I have a friend who does uh, indigenous law and I know most, most of her day, she's actually thinking a lot about like how she relates to the people that she's writing law for. And she's chosen to do that type of law specifically because she wants to help people in that area versus a lot of her friends who are corporate lawyers and don't like the work they do, but feel like they have to. I think one thing that's important about design is that it really pushes us to like, to focus on what we believe in. And I think that will naturally help you be in what you're doing. That's great, amazing. Uh, we've got one more question. Um, I'm wondering how you develop the vocabularies to, oops, uh, one more time. I'm wondering how you develop the vocabularies to best describe your best to describe your concept and the relations that are created in the process, especially when English is not your first language. Any thoughts about that? Can I, can I speak to that? Yes, yes. Um, I remember like starting my project and feeling, having this tension because there are just some things that I could not, it just felt like I needed to communicate differently in like Yoruba. And what someone told me was do it in do it in Yoruba. And if need for transition comes after, then you translate. But I think I found that like really helpful advice because it made the work sit in its authenticity and be almost like almost whole and just be a true depiction of what it actually is supposed to be. Um, and then if space for translation should come up, if there's a place for it, um, it could come up, um, but also, uh, I don't know. And this might be something that is like, maybe not everyone might agree, but it doesn't, I, I found that it doesn't necessarily have to be translated or like made into this language where everybody's trying to understand because I think what we're trying to get at is the fact that this work is to be whole and to be authentically itself. Um, so that's my two cents on that one. <laughs> Beautifully put, the right for opacity, you know, not always for universal translation and consumption. Um, yeah, any I other, Ahmed, yeah. Quickly, um, 
I also like the word opacity and um, the way I treat it is like, I, I try to, um, um, I try to um, uh, like create a, a messy language, you know, I try, I, again, I, I try to get advantage from abstraction. For example, for the voices that I use, there are abstract voices. There is a voice of uh, old jack pump dr drilling the land or a sound of applause or a chainsaw or fire or a street fight. So these are all like abstract universal languages. And I try to develop a visual language uh, using abstraction. And I basically, I try to say what I want to say, but not saying anything specifically or clearly. So I try to yeah, use um, this opaque and wake language or abstract language. That's great. Any final comments or questions, everyone? OK, I think we're good. Well, everyone, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to, to hear all of you speak. Ian, the team from CAGS, thank you so much. Colleagues, faculty, community members from Emily Carr, uh, thank you for coming. So lovely to see you. And this is just a great way to um, put a hopeful tone or an end to a, a challenging year for all of us. So with catastrophe comes hope, right? And, uh, and this is really, um, uh, a really meaningful moment for me. So thank you. Yes, and on behalf of CAGS, thank you uh, to all of our presenters today and for those who joined us in the audience. Uh, the virtual clapping of the hands uh, is due to everyone here. And certainly uh, this has been one of the most exciting events uh, this week and we got to see, listen, feel uh, all the, all the uh, sensory experiences. So that was great and great to see some master students uh, promoting themselves amongst the CAGS network. So that's fantastic. And hopefully we'll get to uh, continue these collaborations uh, down the road. So thank you so much to our speakers today. Zoom high five. <laughs> Take care, everyone.